some time ago, I implemented the Rotary Passcode UI and shared the code with the Flutter community. I may not be the sharpest tool in the shed, and I also said this. Did my tweet reach such an engagement? Yep, in several hours. But do I actually regret doing this? Absolutely, with all of my heart. Labas, my name is Mangerdas, and today we'll implement some useless UI in Flutter. Let's go. This is the original design challenge I found on Twitter. Initially, it was implemented using Swift UI, but I decided to implement it using Flutter and hopefully learn something new. I will split this design challenge into two parts. One of them is static UI, simply implementing all the visible layout elements. In the second part, I will cover the motion design part of the challenge animations, gestures, transitions, and other fancy eye candies visible on the screen. There are two input modes in this UI challenge, the rotary dial input and the simple passcode. The same screen is used in both cases, just the elements are different based on the selected input mode. What's common between them is the header text and the mode switch button at the bottom right corner. Let's implement these elements first. Start with a simple project, where the set preferred orientations method ensures that the app can only be used in portrait mode. Also, for the app's typography, we will use Google Fonts. Thus, add the missing project dependency to the pubspec YAML file. After going through the available Google Fonts, it seems that the CanEat font is a close enough option comparing to the original design. Use it as the main text theme for the app. To start with, Create an empty stateful passcode input view widget with the expected code property and use it as a home page for the app. In the main view, add the safe area widget to ensure system elements not overlapping the UI elements. Then, add some spacing from the screen boundaries using the padding widget. For the layout, use a single column widget. Make sure to use the stretch cross axis alignment property so that the elements would take a maximum width in the column. Now, add the header text and some spacing below it, as well as style it with a display small text style from our theme. Next, create an input mode button that requires two properties. Simple input mode indicates the current button state, whether a rotary dial or a passcode input is used, while the on mode change callback will be used on button click. Of course, add the button at the bottom of the passcode input view. To implement the button, a simple text widget wrapped with the gesture detector is more than enough. So we wrap the placeholder first and pass the callback. Based on the current button mode, provide the corresponding uppercase label and apply the headline small text style from the team data. All the basic shareable elements are implemented. Now comes the fun part, different input types. Let's create an abstract class for the global constants. First, define all the input values used in the UI. Then, define constants for the rotary dial component. Finally, add the padding value for a single dial number and use it to calculate the dial number radius in the UI. For the passcode input, individual dial numbers are positioned evenly in the 4 by 3 grid. Start with the placeholder widget and use it in our passcode input view. The passcode input consists of four rows. Add a column widget to hold them and create three empty row widgets. The fourth row will contain only a single dial number. We will add it to the column a bit later. Each row, except the last one, contains three dial numbers. For now, use the text widget just to render the corresponding values from our constants. As mentioned before, add the last digit separately to the column. Also, do not forget to space the elements evenly both in vertical and horizontal directions. Now, it's time to give a shape to a single dial number. Fun fact! The exact same component is used for both passcode and rotary dial input modes. First, create a base dial number widget that accepts the input number. As usual, replace the placeholder text elements with the new component. Then, give a circular shape to the input with a black background. Luckily, the specific size of our input is already calculated, so use it directly from the constants file. Then, center the label and also apply the headline medium textile to it. That's all for the passcode input mode. Easy. It's time for the essential part of this tutorial, the rotary dial input. As usual, 
Start with a placeholder widget. To be able to switch between different input modes, we need to track the current active mode. The simple input mode flag indicates just that. Switching between different modes is as simple as toggling this flag. Add the onModesChange method. Then, pass the flag and mode change callback to the input mode button instead of hardcoded values. Also, let's not forget to use the correct input mode based on the simple input mode flag. Passcode input when the value is true and the rotary dial input otherwise. To implement the rotary dial input, we need to know the view constraints to size the component properly. Once you hear anything about the view constraints, probably you need a layout builder widget. From the constraints, get the maximum width of the view and use it to set the size of the component. Since the rotary dial input is of a circular shape, the height and width properties are equal. Multiple custom painters are needed to draw the input component on the screen. Let's use an empty one for now and pass the size value. The first shape is a black background ring of the rotary dial input. First, create a boilerplate painter extending the custom painter class. In the input component, pass it as a painter object to the custom paint widget. As mentioned previously, to create a rotary dial input widget, we will use multiple painter objects stacked on top of each other. Thus, add a stack widget and align all the children widgets in the center. Since we will draw custom components on a blank canvas, a useful util method to have is calculating the center offset value from the size object. The rotary dial background is a simple black ring. So define the painter, in other words, the styling used to draw a shape on a canvas, as a black stroke of a specific width from the constants. Then, draw the shape on the screen by using the canvas draw arc method. As a first parameter, pass the rectangle that should contain the given arc. Then, to draw a full circle, set the start angle to zero and the sweep angle to a full circle value in radians. Next, position the dial numbers around the arc. For that, we need to calculate the dial number distance from the center, which is identical for all the dial numbers because something something circle and geometry. Then, iterate over the list of input values and position them around the arc with the transform translate method and pass a directional offset. The question remains, what the f is a directional offset and how it's calculated? From the documentation, Offset from direction creates an offset from its direction and distance. The distance value is straightforward. We use the dial number distance from center value. It's a bit more entertaining with the direction itself. As we see, the direction is provided in radians clockwise like this. However, in our case, the dial numbers are positioned counterclockwise. Thus, we use the minus sign in the direction calculations. To position the dial numbers properly, we need to calculate the specific direction for each of them. Thus, we split each quadrant into three equal parts or p divided by six radians each. That's where we get the multiplier here. Lastly, we calculate the direction for each i value in the loop. The last missing piece is the moving upper arc part of the rotary dial input. Again, use a custom paint widget and pass the same size value. The base foreground painter is very similar to the background one. Just pass the number radius from center value that will be used to cut out the holes needed for dial numbers. Don't forget to pass an instance of the painter in the rotary dial input view. To make this painter work, define some more constants, yay! A helpful one is the position of a first dial number. Then, calculate the maximum angle or the position of a last dial number and the sweep angle or the length of the arc. Oh, and to make it even more complex, these values are inverted a bit to fit the canvas draw arc method. You see, usually radians are calculated from the positive x-axis going counterclockwise. But while using the draw arc method, positive angles are going clockwise around the oval. As I like to say, improvise, adapt, overcome. As with the background painter, create a painter object. Just the width is a bit smaller this time. Then. Create the foreground arc by using the already calculated constants. We need 10 cutouts for the dial numbers. So start from the calculated first dial number position and go around the arc clockwise this time. For each hole, draw a circle of the same radius as a dial number and apply the clear blend mode for it. At the moment, dial numbers are not visible. It's because we are using blend modes and when you hear anything about blend modes, 
Well, it's more or less black magic. Here's the proof. However, the thing that I know for sure is that you need to use the save layer method to draw everything as a single group and not as individual pieces. This is exactly what we need. We do not want to draw holes on top of the arc, but rather cut them out as a single piece. For this, save the layer before drawing an arc so that all the subsequent canvas calls will be appended to the same group. Then, call the canvas restore method at the end to pop the whole layer from the stack. Finally, draw a little white circle which will be used as a dial stop. It's this part of the phone. That's it. Both of the input views are finished. The good news is that it was the most complex part of the static UI. The only missing piece of the design is the passcode digits indicator. In both modes, the same passcode digits component is used. Just its alignment is a bit different. And sizing. And maybe spacing. However, trust me, it is truly the same component. I can prove it to you. Start with an ugly rectangle as a placeholder. Then, create a base widget that requires two properties. The passcode digit values or the current user input and the input mode flag. The passcode digit indicators will have different background and font colors based on the current state of the animation. Thus, create a dedicated model to track the state and use it instead of the dynamic type for the passcode digit values list. In the main view, store a list of the current input values. In the init state method, set the initial values and the corresponding properties for them. Then, replace the placeholder container with the actual passcode digits widget. One more side quest. A useful util to have in any app is an add between method that inserts a specific separator widget between each element in the list. This will be used later for the UI. Before implementing the actual component, define some constants since the widget sizing is a bit different based on the selected input mode. First, set the default widget height. Then, add an empty row to position the elements properly. For each digit in the row, create a placeholder container and add some spacing between the elements based on the selected input mode. Then, define a passcode digit container, a single element visible in the view representing user's input. Again, use it instead of the placeholder container. For the container, set alignment and shape values. To make the testing part easier, replace the default initialization code of empty values with the ones covering all the possible passcode digit cases. For the inner container, calculate the correct sizing first. Then, do some containerception by adding a digit container inside the wrapper or the background one. This will indicate the current status of an input value. Lastly, show the digit value if there is one and apply some styling from the text theme. Here you can see the final result. Of course, it is still not usable at the moment, but that's something for the next part of the tutorial where we will focus on the motion design part of the UI. Thanks for watching. Safe trees, stay solid, and see you around.